But last week we started a series called uh, Selfless, and we focused that very first week really on being uh, ambassadors, sharing the message that God has given us to the world around us. And so I kind of said for some of the people that were in here when we first started this little sheet of paper, hopefully most of you have gotten one of these already. Let me explain again what this is for and what we would like you to do and what I would hope you might be able to do with us is that the Intermountain Church Planners Association is an association that we support as a church. Uh, they are an organization that I happen to be on their executive team, and we help plant churches throughout the Intermountain West. Uh, in, the, in the past 20 years, I think we've planted 23 different churches, um, and over its lifetime, about 40 different churches have been planted through the Intermountain Church Planners Association. And one of the goals that we set as a group of churches and individuals was to see 100,000 souls come to Christ in the next 10 years. And we know that's a lot for the Intermountain West. Uh, and so we thought, okay, what's the best way to go about doing that? And nothing happens apart from prayer. So we decided to uh, partner with our sister churches to encourage people like you and me to come up with a list of 10 different individuals who are not churched, okay? We're talking about unchurched individuals that you can put on a list that you can begin to pray for every day for the next year, for the rest of this year. Those 10 people get prayed for every single day. Uh, and to let us know that you are partnering with us, that's what this is about. Uh, you can simply use the QR code with your phone and go to the website and sign up, okay? Uh, and then you'll be logged in. They'll also, if you request it, they'll send you a little uh, bookmark that has 10 slots on it that you can put the names of the people that you're praying for. Uh, but that means you're going to partner with us and other churches. Right now, there's, I think, 35 different churches that are now partnering right around there. They're not all out of our movement. Uh, there are different churches that we have asked to join in with us, and we've had a lot of people on FaceTime calls, or I should say Zoom calls, to explain it to them, and people are anxious and excited about partnering in prayer to reach lost people. Uh, one of the things we'll do here is I will set up a board out in the foyer, and when you have your 10 names, I'm going to give you the opportunity to put the first name of that person on the board so all of us can begin praying for those people and keep that in front of us that, hey, we want to pray for at least 10 people that we know that's in our circle of influence for one full year asking God to bring uh, the message of Jesus to them and that they might give their lives to Christ. Um, it's powerful, and if you've never done something like that, persistent prayer for those that you care for, you can see all kinds of things happen. So if you would like to be a part of that, that's what that's for. There's more of these out in the foyer. It's really easy. If you don't use a QR code, I also put the web address on the back side on the bottom, and you can go directly to the web address, and you can go ahead and sign up that way as well. So if you have any questions about it, don't know how to make it happen, need help doing it, just see me after service, and we'll get you, get you signed up. But really, when we're talking about being selfless, one of the most selfless things we can do is invest our lives in other people, and that's what this is all about. So this week, though, we're going to change and look at a, some, another selfless aspect of the Christian life, and uh, we're going to take a look back for just a moment when Jesus came. Uh, you know, the arrival of Jesus signaled what I would call an end to the temple model that focused on self and the beginning of something entirely new and selfless. There was basically two models in Scripture. You have the temple model of how you do faith, and you have the Jesus model as far as the New Testament is concerned. And they were different. The temple model was kind of a model where people went to a sacred place. The sacred place was the temple. It had all kinds of rituals that were done there. In the Jesus model, there's a brand new covenant relationship with people where you have a relationship with God that doesn't depend on the place that you are, but the fact that God lives within you. Uh, in the temple model, they had what I would call sacred text. And the text was honored above all things. It was reserved for those who uh, were priests. They were the ones who got to handle everything. In the New Testament model, it's all available to everyone. God's word through Jesus Christ. And he gives us some new commands. In fact, old commands that are made new by what Jesus has to say. In, in the temple model, it all focused around sacred men. There were men who had certain sacred responsibilities, the, the priests that came out of the tribe of Levi, and they, they functioned to serve the church, and they were revered above other people, and their authority was pretty much unchallenged. 
And in the New Testament, there's kind of a new ethic that all of us are priests. We all have a responsibility for the message of Jesus Christ. We all have this empowerment through God's Holy Spirit to be his messenger and ambassador to the world. Now, even though in the temple model you had followers that were sincere, they were sincere because they were afraid. They wanted to make sure that they did everything they were supposed to do according to the law that was written so that God would find them acceptable. In the New Testament model of Jesus, we have this whole new movement where we are considered acceptable through Christ Jesus and we live from a different motive. We live from a heart of saying, we love him, therefore we serve him. We don't serve him to get him to love us. And so there's this big distinction between what I would call the temple model of how things were done and the Jesus model. And when you look at that temple model, honestly, the temple model is me-centered. It's all about me when you think about it. It's what must I do or believe to make things and keep things right between God and, and us? What do I have to do? Okay, If I do all the right things, then God will be happy with me. And you know how miserable that can be. Uh, when you're worried about doing all the right things, because then if you don't do all the right things, you wonder if God's going to be happy with you. But the center of this isn't God. The center of that approach is you. It focuses on what you're doing, what you're thinking, and are you going to be okay with God? And, and so you think about you, you, you most of the time. And what happens then is that this kind of temple thinking gravitates towards rules and it gravitates towards rituals and things that you do or you perform to show you that you are acceptable to God. That's kind of the whole Old Testament model of doing things. That's why they had so many rules. That's why they had so many laws. That's why they had so many rituals. And if we adopt that kind of mindset today, it, uh, we might not see the rules and rituals like you did in the Old Testament, but you'll see the attitudes that developed from people that lived by rules and rituals. And that would be, people would become judgmental. They would look at each other and pass judgment on each other. They would become hypercritical of each other, always comparing that I'm doing more than you are, I'm more acceptable than you are. And that attitude is still pervasive even in the church today when you have that idea that you live by laws. You live by a little checklist. And so that model didn't work very well. That's one of the reasons Jesus came. Uh, another question that temple model causes you to ask is this. What exactly must, must I do to make things and keep things right between God and me? What do I have to perform? Okay. Now, you're saying, well, I don't know if I struggle with that. I'm going to give you some uh, things to think about and say, do you maybe have a little bit of this temple model mindset in your, in, in your Christian walk? Like, for example, if you feel guiltier about missing church, than mistreating someone at work, that's probably a temple mindset. You're working on performance. Or if you sit around wondering how close you can get to sin without actually sinning, uh, that's kind of that old temple mindset. What can I do? To, and, and how far can I go and not upset God? Uh, if you believe there's some kind of ritual or activity that you can perform that makes you right with God and removes your responsibility to make restitution to someone that you've harmed, then you're probably living under a temple model. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. Uh, if you're more concerned about someone paying for the pain they've caused you instead of forgiving them, you're probably living under a temple model in your life because you're focusing on things that Jesus would not focus on. If your, your views about religion keep you from loving the person next to you, then you're probably living under a temple model. And it's so easy to gravitate because rules make us feel comfortable. You know, having specific guidelines make us feel very comfortable because then we can check a box and say, yep, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. Therefore, God is going to accept me. I'm okay with God. And that's not the model Jesus left us with. We have to abandon that model. But it seeps into Christianity all the time. And our hearts can tell us whether it's really there or not. So we want to challenge you about how to be truly selfless is learning how to live under the model that Jesus gave us. Because his model was different. The Jesus model is centered on the person beside you. It's not centered on you. It's centered on the person sitting right next to you. The, the neighbor, the person that you work with, the person across the street, the person in the grocery store that you run into. It's centered on the person right beside you. It's an invitation to lead the it's all about me kind of religion to it's all about you. 
It's all about someone else. It's not about me any longer. And when, when you use this concept and when you understand it and when you, when you make it part of who you are, you get to see what happens in the New Testament happen again. People wonder, why did, why did the Christianity explode in the first century? It's because people had this understanding that it was not about them. It was about the person next to them. It was outside of yourself. They, they understood that, and so they had this uncommon love for other people that people had never really experienced before, and everyone seemed to gravitate towards it. It was just phenomenal to see the explosion in the first, second, and third centuries. And this invitation that Jesus gives us to leave all about me behind and make it all about others is the Jesus model. That's how he wants things done. In fact, he said it this way in John 13. A new command I give you, love one another. And I can imagine they're saying, well, we've heard that command before. But then he makes it more personal. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. And I, I, I think you need to read the words as they're written. This doesn't say, if you want to. This is a command that says, you must. And you must love, and you must love like I loved. Not like you might define love, because all of us can define love differently. I mean, in, in the Greek language, there's four or five different words for the word love. But this is talking about the agape love, the love of God, a selfless love, one that's looking outside of yourself, not focusing on yourself. And Jesus says, I need you to love others just like I loved you. I want you to do it that way. In Galatians 5.14, Paul picks this very same message up when he says, for the entire law, the Old Testament law he's talking about, is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to love our neighbor. If you remember, somebody went to Jesus once and said, who's my neighbor? <laughs> right? And he basically said, anyone you run into is your neighbor. Uh, whoever has a need, whoever's next to you, that person next to you becomes the person that you're supposed to love. And Paul understood this so deeply that when he was talking about what was really most important for him as a follower of Christ, he comes up with this phenomenal statement that, that I, I, I remember all the time. It's in the Galatians 5, verse 6, when he is really talking about what's most important. And he says this, the only thing. Now, I want you to hear that in the, in the original language. It means the one and only thing, not one of the most important things, not something that's really kind of important, but there's other important things. He says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that matters to you and I as a follower of Christ, according to Paul, is how we express the love of God, uh, our faith, to the world around us. How do we demonstrate love to the world? That is the only thing that really counts, which summarizes who Jesus is. It summarizes the message of Christ. It's a message of love. It summarizes the definition of who God is because God is love, and he calls us to be like him. And so Paul has incorporated this into his thinking and said, guys, get this, the only thing that counts, this is all that matters. If, if he can boil Christianity down to one particular thing, he said it is Faith expressing itself through love. If you have faith in Christ, then it will show in the way that you love. Because Christ is love. So we get this picture. And that's a complete uh, leaving behind of the, the, the temple model. It's departing from that. It's all about you and you having to be okay so that God will accept you too. It's all about the people around you. It's all about that person sitting next to you. Do you know why you should tell the truth? Why should you tell the truth? Because it's unloving not to. That's why. Real love is truthful. It always tells the truth. Do you know why you should be generous? Because love can't help but be generous. It's not that you have to be generous. It's that love pushes you to be generous because you care about the needs of others so you will sacrifice your own needs for the needs of other people that's generosity that's where it comes from it comes from a heart of love you know why you shouldn't talk badly about someone 
because that's unloving. It's just completely unloving to talk badly about someone else. It's not that, oh, it's bad to talk bad about someone. I'm not supposed to. No, no. It's because you love so much, you can't even think about talking badly about someone. Love just doesn't do that. You know why uh, you shouldn't pressure your girlfriend or your boyfriend to have sexual activity? Oh, is it because God doesn't like that? Well, of course he doesn't. You know why he doesn't like it? Because it's not loving. It is not loving to pay, play fast and loose with sexuality because you diminish future sexual satisfaction in marriage by taking the steps way too early. And God says, that's not loving. If you truly love someone, you don't do that to them. You don't pressure them. You don't take them down that path. I, I, hear, I talk to this with, with young people all the time. Says, what if it's consensual? So what? Do you have to have a verse for everything? I mean, honestly, if it's not loving, you just don't do it. Love says, no, I honor, I respect you, I don't force you, I don't push you where you need to be, and I want for you to have the greatest experience in every area of your life, including your sexuality, so no, I'm not going there. I'm not going there, because that's what love does. It's not a check-in-the-box activity. It's a heart attitude towards others. Okay? The New Testament imperatives, the, the rules, if you want to say it that way, or the guidelines that were given by God, are examples of how to demonstrate your love for God by loving others. All those commands, all those one another commands that you find in Scripture are an example of loving others, doing it the way God would want us to love each other. And we demonstrate our love for God when we love others. Okay? It's just a demonstration. It's all connected and, and so when you become selfless, you, you have this attitude in your heart that I love others so much, I don't matter. It is not about me. And that is so counter to what we're told every day in this world. The world says it's all about you. And God says, no, it's about the person next to you. It's about truly loving the person next to you. Jesus said the entire Old Testament hung on that truth about loving one another. When he was asked, what are the most important commands? He said, love the Lord your God, right? Then he said, and love your neighbor as yourself. Get outside of yourself. Those commands, those imperatives were not for you, they were for others. So take your eyes, don't make it about you, love others. And, and we really dumb down Christianity when we make it all about ourselves. We have really missed the central message of Jesus Christ when it's all about me. It needs to be all about others. But here's the reality, because this is not human nature. The reality is the Jesus model is less complicated, but it is far more demanding. Okay? It's less complicated. It's simple. Love others like I have loved others. But it's very demanding because it requires us to put ourselves to the side. And that's not easy, let's be honest. That is not our natural tendency, is to put ourselves to the side. But I want you to understand who is asking this of you. The center of Christianity, the reason Christianity is important, is because there was a man covered in his own blood and the saliva of other people who died for you. And when his commands are given to us, that gives import to everything that he says. It's easy to find a place to live in the temple approach. It's easy to set up rules and regulations for yourself. Yep, I attended service, I gave, I did this, I did that. Oh, God, you should be okay with me, I've checked all the boxes. And then hate the person sitting next to you. Or badmouth someone that you've had a problem with. Or wish retribution on someone that has hurt you. And God's saying, really? It's not how many checks you got. Are you loving them like my son loves them? And what did Jesus do? He went to a cross for those who hated him. That's what he did. He gave his life for those that could have cared less about him. In a temple religion, you're going to always look for the loopholes. 
You're always going to find, how close can I get? What can I do? How can I get around this? How can I justify my actions? How can I compare myself to other people and say, well, look, I might be doing this, but they're doing a whole lot worse, so God, it's okay. I'm better than that person. But in Jesus' model, he's our example. And you can't get away from Jesus because that's who we're called to be like. And that selfless love that he demonstrates to us, okay? In fact, this is what it says in Philippians 2.5. In your relationships with one another, have what? The same mindset as Jesus Christ. You think about relationships like Jesus thinks about relationships. That's what he tells us to do. Jesus said it this way in Luke 6. Love your enemies. Do good for those who hate you. Man, that's tough. That's a tall order. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Luke 6, 36, be merciful, how? Just as your Father is merciful. You want the example? You look to Jesus. You look to the Father, and you see what love actually does. And you begin to ask yourself, how do I demonstrate that? And this is why I believe the Christian faith is so phenomenal. There are no loopholes. There aren't. When it comes to what God asks us to do, there's no loopholes. He gives us his Holy Spirit inside of us to be obedient to him, to fill us with the love that that he wants us to demonstrate the world, and then he says, do it every time. Not just sometimes, not when you feel like it, not when you like the person, not when it's convenient, not when you want to leverage your love so you can get something back from someone else. You just love like Jesus did. You love like the Father did when he sent his only son. You love like the Son did when he went to a cross for you when you didn't want him to. You love because that's who we are. It's what you are. So you love like he loves. An uncommon love asks, what does love require of me? What does love require of me? And when Paul said that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love, that's what he was asking. In every situation I find myself, what does love require of me? And just think about how important that question could be for us on an everyday basis. You run into a situation when you're in conflict with, say, a, a, a neighbor, right? Maybe it's, I have some neighbors that are fighting over property lines, and I mean, I've watched it. They've almost come to blows. I mean, it, seriously, it's been really awful to watch. And I sit back and I go, you know, if either of you adopted the attitude, what does love require of me, this situation would disappear. Because you'd be thinking about the other person, not yourself. If it's your spouse or your child or a coworker or a friend or a fiancé, a husband, a wife, what does love require of me in this situation? When you don't feel like forgiving someone, what does love require of you? To forgive. So what do we do? We do what love requires. We forgive. When, when restitution needs to be made, what does love require of me? To do everything I can to fix what I have broken. To make restitution if possible, because that's what love requires. When I don't feel like praying for someone who's hurt me, what does love require of me? To hit my knees and pray. Because he said to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? That's what love does. That's selflessness. That's the love that Jesus wanted to bring to us. And if we're honest, we almost always know the answer to that question in every situation. If we're honest with ourselves and say, what does love require of me in this situation? You almost always know the answer. It's getting to the answer that's the hard part. It's doing it, not just knowing it, but getting it in our heart and expressing it through our hands and making it happen. That's that's the difficult part. So I said the Jesus model is far less complicated, but it's a lot more demanding because it requires us to demonstrate it all the time. Now, go back to the first century for for a moment. The first century church, they had absolutely no Bibles. They they didn't have a Bible. The Bible is a collection of historical documents that didn't come into existence until the fourth century. Okay, so they had scarce writings. Uh, 
They really didn't have any formal places to meet easily because they were under persecution. They consisted of the very, very poor to the very, very rich. They, they ran the whole spectrum of humanity at the time. Uh, there were slaves. There were masters in the church at the time. Uh, and people were hypercritical of them about everything because of what they believed. But if you read history, they were also very envious of them because of how they treated one another. It's really interesting. Hypercritical of them about what they believe, but looked at them and said, man, that's an uncommon love. Where did that come from? And they were attracted to them because of the way that they loved one another. And what I think is awesome is that can happen today too. I mean, Christianity is under attack. And we're under attack for what we believe. But if we are living out a love-based faith every single day, people are going to look at it and say, where does that come from? Where does that kind of love come from? The love that can forgive, the love that can look past differences, the love that can care when no one else wants to care, the love that steps in when everybody steps out of your life. Where does that love come from? From Jesus. It's a selfless love. And the world sits up and it takes notice. And they say, that's, that's just different. And this isn't just all about other people and how we treat them. This is principally about God. Because if we love God, we express His love to the world. If we love Him, we love like He loves. Okay? This isn't some simple, watered-down, oh, be nice to your neighbor kind of message. This is, do you really love God? Because when you love God, you love others. Because He loves others. And then we love what He loves. And everything else in Scripture becomes an illustration of His love towards humanity. And you read your New Testament with new eyes and say, what does love really look like? And it just jumps out every page you see the love of God being presented. Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man comes in glory and, in, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. It tells us one day Christ is going to return because He said He would. He's coming for those that He loves. It goes on in Matthew 25, 32 to say, and all the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And we get this image that, that there's going to be this division among people. He will put the sheep on his right, goats on his left. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Who are those? Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Why are we so blessed by an inheritance? Because God prepared it for those that he loves, but those that demonstrated his love, because we get the explanation of who that's for next. Who is this really for? For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you? When did we see you? When did we see that happen? When did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothing, clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? I want to stop there and just want you to think about that. When? Because they're confused. They're saying, Jesus, we've not done that for you. We haven't done any of those things. So when did we see that? When did we see you in that condition? When did, when did we feel like we had to step in and take care of you? When did that happen? Because for them, Jesus had been doing that for them all along. But not, nobody was really doing it for him. And he's, they're, so they're really confused about this whole idea of what's happening. I mean, often in, in our own relationship with Christ, we get confused about what really means being close to Jesus. We'll come to a worship service and experience some real closeness through singing and, and fellowship with one another. Or you might take a trip to the Holy Land and feel really close to God because you get to walk where Jesus walked and see the things that he saw and kind of experience what life was like. Or uh, Many of you have probably gone to a conference or some kind of retreat and it pumps you way up and you feel really close to God during those times. Or maybe it's through study, or maybe it's a camp that you went to, or maybe it's through your prayer time. All those things make us feel really good. 
about who? About us. We feel really good about us all of a sudden. But the essence of following Jesus is not about you. It's not about attending all those things, being a part of all those things. Jesus said it this way, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You know what brings an inheritance to you? You know what makes you special? It's how you love others. That's it. It's not how you feel about yourself. It's not how good something makes you feel or how close it draws you to God. It's about you loving others. The essence of following Jesus is not about you. It's not. The Jesus model centers on the person beside you. Looking to the right, looking to the left, and saying, what does love require of me? Okay. The devotion to God is illustrated and demonstrated and authenticated by your love for others. Whatever you have done for the least of these, you have done it for me. That only makes sense in when we use our hands and heart and our head to love other people. It's one thing to say, oh, I love other people. I don't know any Christians, not being critical, I don't know any Christian who would say, no, I don't love other people. <laughs> they wouldn't say that. Say, no, I love other people. Jesus would say, okay, when did you do these things? And it's not about your performance. He's just trying to make this connection that says, if you love, you cannot sit still. You must act. You must reach out. You must do the things that love requires of you, and you do it consistently and faithfully because that is what I have done by placing my Holy Spirit inside of you. The gift of the Holy Spirit. What's the very first gift? Love. Love is the first part of that gift, that fruit that we have in us because he said, this is what I want you to do. And Paul said, get it. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. It's the only thing that counts. It's all that matters. When Jesus said, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you do what? Have love for one another. Have love for one another. That's the big challenge. This is not easy. I'm just going to tell you that. It's not easy. I wish it was. Because honestly, some people are very unlovable, aren't they? And if you don't know who that person is, it's probably you, okay, in your life. Sometimes we're hard to take, aren't we? But what does love require of me? It requires me to be like Jesus to them. And that even means if I have to give my life, I do so. There's no greater love than laying down your life for your friend. And... I doubt for anybody in this room that God's going to ask you to lay down your life for your friend. But they may ask you to sacrifice your time, your pride, your desire for vengeance. All those things. He may say, I want you to sacrifice those things. Lay them down and pick up my love and show it to the person who doesn't seem to deserve it but needs it more than anyone. Just like I did for you. Love as I have loved, because the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. What if to honor God is just simply love others? What if it's just that simple? So today, what I want you to walk away with is that simple question in your heart. What does love require of me? What does love require of me? And whatever situation you find yourself in relationally with someone right now, ask that question. What does love require of me? And then once you answer that question, act on it. Act on it. It's just thinking about it's not enough. Jesus didn't think about loving you. He gave his life because he loved you. We love like he loves, so we ask every day 
in every situation, what does love require of me? Let's pray. Father, we are so humbled by the demonstration of love that you have for us, that you have sacrificed so much for us, that you have been so gracious to us and so merciful to us. Father, thank you for being a gracious and merciful God. Thank you, Father, for teaching us what real love is through your Son, Jesus. Father, I would ask that you would forgive any of us who have been unloving. I know for many right now, unforgiveness is in their heart. Bitterness has grown up. Our attitudes and actions don't demonstrate a love for the person next to us at times. We're all guilty. But it's our desire to honor you and love like you do. So, Father, forgive us for those times when we haven't. And empower us with your spirit in the future to respond in love the next time that opportunity presents itself. To truly ask before we speak, before we act, what does love require of me? And may our lives be an example of Jesus Christ to the world around us. May you empower us through your spirit to live a life of love that is uncommon and selfless and that the world will take notice and they'll be drawn to you. May we be your loving ambassadors to the world. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.